So, uh, HBI here, six-year-old male, history of asymptomatic, slow-growing, right upper pole, renal mass, past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, oh, yeah. and prostate cancer two years ago. Past surgical history, had a parathyroidectomy about eight years ago. Prostate biopsy about two months ago. It's on selectomy colonoscopy. Better? Family history of heart disease, mother and father, prostate cancer, and the maternal uncle. And 50 pack year smoking history. Quit 37 years ago. Drinks about one alcoholic beverage. Next slide, please. So the medication list, as you can see here, multiple hypertensives. Um, Next slide. So this is a CT from 7, 2019 here. You can see the tumor in the anterior right upper pole measuring approximately 2.1 by 2.0 centimeters. Uh, next slide. This is uh, from the biopsy in 2019 of October of that year. Uh, hmm. Demonstrate clear cell, renal cell carcinoma. Next slide. And this is the CT from just recently in 9-18-20. Uh, it's slow growing. It's about 3.8 by 2.2 centimeters. Hmm. On compared to the prior year. Next slide. So the treatment options for this RCC are we can monitor it, we can embolize and stage it for a stage ablation later on. We can do a partial or a complete nephrectomy. Next slide. So the treatment options continued here. So the renal nephrometry store, um, which categorizes renal masses by their surgical complexity um, in the uh, diagram below. This particular tumor was a 9A, an intermediate complexity, which gives it about 11.1% likelihood of a major complication in surgery. Next slide. Another scoring system here, more a recent one, the PRAC, or percutaneous renal ablation complexity score, which is useful in uh, stratifying percutaneous renal ablation complexity. You see the uh, arrows, which are hard for me to see here, but hopefully you all can see them. Uh, the numbers that we gave them in each category there with a total score of 12.5 and gives us a high complexity score with a technical success rate of 86% with ablation. Next slide. So ablation, our embolization prior to ablation, we have pre-ablation embolization has potential benefits of improving local control, protecting against hemorrhage, and enhancing tumor localization during ablation. It's safe and feasible and most beneficial for RCCs over three and a half centimeters like this one. Next slide. So here we see this is a the right renal artery, right main renal artery coming off and good, uh, good approach for a radial case. So we'll talk about this case in a second, but I want to show you guys um, one thing uh, before we go down into the kidney. We were having some difficulty with the serra radial coming down the arch. So this is sort of my favorite way to do this if you can't get down with your base catheter that you're t t trying to use is I take a SIM-1. So this is a Terumo 100 centimeter SIM-1 with an exchange link Benson. And so I'm going to just push this down into the heart and form it down here. Uh, and then I'm going to sort of spin the catheter over to the other side without the wire. And then I'm going to flip it back, push a little wire out as I bring this catheter back on the undersurface of the aorta. You guys see how we just did that? And then we send the wire down. Oh, we missed it. Let's try it one more time. So this is a pretty challenging anatomy just in general. Elder, elderly men, I tend to find, have this tortuosity more than, than uh, elderly women, but that's just my personal experience. And so you can see the tortuosity there. I'm going to take this catheter out, and now we're just going to go down uh, with the seroradial. So it takes a little, literally it takes about 30 seconds to do that, and it works every time, as opposed to using different wires and catheters. I think that's sort of the, the best way to do it. I almost always, if I'm going to ablate a T1B, I almost always embolize it. But this is a, you know, large T1A, and so really what, what I prefer to do is just ablate them if I can. But I, I found that with these larger lesions, you tend to have more endophytic tumors uh, that are more tricky to ablate. When he came in a year ago to do that uh, biopsy, we were actually planning on doing an ablation. And I decided to not do the ablation at that time because I was a little bit concerned about the complexity of it and the risk for him. Um, and, you know, given his, his active lifestyle and everything else, we were not super excited about ablating at that time. So I said, let's just watch it. But then it got considerably bigger this year. Good.
Go ahead. And in retrospect, Keep right, on. like you probably wished you would have gotten it at 2.2 centimeters instead of 3.8, right? So I think, you know, that's that's kind of the thing. Mm. And, and, and there's some series out there mm-hmm. looking at oh, embolizing and endophytic tumors. And definitely the endophytic tumors are the ones that huh. when you look at renal nephrometry, like the score doesn't doesn't predict so well complications but size which is a component of the score and endophysicity like how close it is to the collecting system also does a little bit better so these endophytic ones certainly the larger ones i mean those are the ones that you really want to be thinking about you know embolizing beforehand yeah yeah and i thought this was a good case for that i i um i'm looking at this angio now and i see some hypervascularity but it's not overwhelming like you sometimes see with rcc yeah yeah, right. yeah so what we're going to do yeah, okay so we're going to pull back the catheter to just proximal there we're going to repeat the angio we're just going to puff as we pull back just so we don't miss it but yeah i think that that branch was probably contributing to it but we'll see the nice thing about the sarah radial is it has multiple side holes and so it gives us a great opportunity to get a good angio yeah, right there. Pull back a tiny bit more Well, I think Duroc is finishing. I don't know if that uh, the armor registry finished or not. Right there was through the SIR Foundation. There was a so much the armor registry for yeah. renal ablation. Yeah, I just can't uh, see from over here. Aaron, I think you were part of that registry, celiac. right? The, yeah, that. it does. That's why it's actually still ongoing. Um, okay. We're we with the the data collection is basically done, but it's still being compiled. Yeah, um, that's fine. Double it over and over yeah, just and go it beyond over. it, and then you can come back. And, and yeah, I think I think we're going to have a lot of data on microwave that we didn't have previously. I mean, obviously, we have a fair amount of data on cryo, yeah. uh, but I don't know. You know, I think for a lesion this big, I, I think as you get to these larger lesions, cryo becomes a little bit more challenging because you need to use multiple probes. In a case like this where the tumor is not particularly hypervascular, do you think there's any role for cone beam? I think there definitely is a role. Um, I tend to find that these usually have these RCCs that are not super big. T- typically, have just one major feeder. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, we're going to do a quick little run this here. Is the, best, this is the best recruitment strategy ever. Yeah. Yeah. That's good what work. I was thinking. <laughs> Open faculty position at UAB. Come play golf. Okay, it's a little higher. It's like just a touch higher. Yeah, it's actually it's 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 pretty challenging um, <laughs> to sort of get it to face that that side, and so I don't I don't think it's the actual shape of the catheter. I think it's just the tortuosity of the arch. So I'm trying to straighten it out with a stiff glide wire here, mm-hmm. but it's not really not really facing that side. Yeah, I mean we could also just we could also do like a guide cast if we just want. We have a, we have a slender uh, sheath, but I don't I don't know that that's really necessary. I think. We already proved that we got into it, or at least uh, before, so I th- we should be able to do it. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just push this distal, and then we're going to check the arch again. So we'll go up, we'll just take a look, make sure we're not redundant here. I mean, we are a little bit, but I'm going to reduce that mm-hmm. if I can. Go back down, put down uh, past the renal, and just let it sort of face that way. That um, and then we're going to... Probably going to take the glide wire. I hate to use glide wires in renal arteries, but I think it'll probably be okay. Three. Can you put that up and put a road map? Three. That's fine. Yeah, three is fine. Uh, I don't even see it on that run. It's a nice hook. It's a nice hook somewhere. The catheter. Oh, it might be here, but it's not a great run. Have you guys seen this? This is the ultimate three. I think that might be a little bit better. That's what I grew up with. But it looks very similar. Yeah. 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 So you guys are seeing definitely the the issues with aortic tortuosity because I knew initially that this would be a challenge because he had that um Come forward. that steep arch that we had to use the Simmons. It's just one of those days. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Right. Let's days. use the glide wire yeah. for this. Nice work. <laughs> well. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you were talking about preserving his renal function um, earlier. Do you, uh, does that you know play a strong role in whether you decide to embolize these patients, their baseline renal function? 
No, because most most small T1A lesions, when you ablate, you have no negative effect in a normal ablation on kidney function. Can you go a little higher? Um, so I'm not worried about that. I think from the embolization perspective, yeah, you could get reflux and you could definitely create... Uh, more non-target just from a aggressive embolization. Not that we would do mm -hmm. that with a standard microcatheter, but I think to to have, you know, to have a, you know, some sort of anti-reflux effect, I think makes sense, particularly with this mm -hmm. this end hole. Where is this thing? Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Look at that. Uh, okay, so let's good. let's do a quick. <laughs> let's see. If, you can't. Let's, Let's see if we can wire that top branch. We'll do that first. I think you have a little room. Tough. Yeah, I don't know that that's actually supplying it. You can breathe. It's actually not. It's. I don't think it is. It's actually supplying the top of the kidney, which is why we didn't see the top of the kidney before. Doop, 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 doop. And we'll, we'll see if that's uh, the, the right vessel. Now, we could do a comb beam CT and do embo guide, but... You know, I you know treat this like a liver case, but I think for for this, it's it's probably not necessary. Can you guys see everything? Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. Right. I'm just going a bit beyond, so you can. We're gonna take a, a quick peek in this branch here. Contrast. Right here. Yeah. So we have a little bit of a interesting artery here because it looks like it's the proximal branches supply the the tumor, but the the, the distal branches don't. Do we think that is tumor? Um, or or it's just not that hypervascular. So we're going to do a different oblique. No. I'm not sold on that. No, that looks like normal parenchyma yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you guys agree? One. Yeah. You can see that there's Sense definitely tumor vessels off from. of this distal branch up here, right? So you can see a round a roundness to it. I just I wonder if it's the other branch. Yeah, let's I mean that's the next one to Okay, let me see that wire. Check. Would expect to see a little bit more hypervascularity on this angio. But you see the tumor there, it's sitting there waiting <clears> for us. You think that's it? <laughs> that looks like it Pointing probably to it. could be it. Let's just go up here and take a look. Nope. Mm -hmm. Everything but. Everything but, right? <laughs> We're going to take a different oblique here just to make sure that we actually see. We're not going to pull back into the aorta this time. Yeah, it's just really not that. Uh... It's a better oblique. All right, so let's put that image up. Up here. Just wanted to show this image. This was the final image from the, the case that we just did in room one. Um, Blue is looking at this great. for the first time. We actually got a fair amount of perfusion in there. There is definitely a, a little bit of non-target on the on that side. There was really no way to avoid that. If we we're going to truly embolize this, mm -hmm. I think um, that was really the only way to do it. So the decision was either embolize it and get a little non-target or uh, don't embolize it at all. And obviously he was here to get this embolized. I didn't think that this ablation would be really that um, as, as safe without this type of uh, pre-embolization. So that's, that was the final image. He did great. Um, is, are there any comments from the, uh, the moderators? I know Blue might have a comment. So, yeah, we're looking at here, this is the, did you end up mixing the beads and the lapai at all? We put, uh, we actually upsized the beads a little bit just because I knew we were going to get some non-target. So mm -hmm. I, I put 200s in instead of uh, 75s and that was the end of it. We put a little a couple CCs and that was, that was the end of the case. So as, as difficult as it was to see that tumor, clearly the lapiodol found it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's a little bit of non-target, which is which is okay. I think that whole territory on the top of the kidney is going to be ablated anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that I was fine with that. But I mean, these are these are challenging cases, and I think, you know, if, if we have a lesion that we think can be ablated and we can we can do it safely. And again, the first time I decided not to do it, I think now we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and do it because it's getting much bigger. So that's sort of uh, that case.